Amen, indeed. That is the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church Quartet. That's Jeff Warren, Mike Proctor, Tommy Bartlett, and David Swore singing lead on that one. And that song's entitled, Not For Long. Great message and a great job by our quartet. Good evening and welcome to our Mount Pleasant Bible Institute Bible Study for Monday, September 9th, 2024. I'm Dr. Joseph Speciali. Good to be back with you after taking the Labor Day holiday off. And we are thrilled that you've chosen to make our Bible study part of your day today, whenever it is that you're listening or watching this. As we'll be with you for the next two hours, if you allow us, we'll be studying the book of Genesis in hour number one and the Gospel of Matthew in hour number two. Don't really have any announcements to share with you before we go to the Lord in Prayer, other than we will have some additional information probably next week regarding our fall revival at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. Of course, we won't have any Bible studies during the week of revival, and right now that's scheduled to be Monday, September uh, 30th, through that Wednesday, whenever that is, I believe it would be October what is that? The 2nd? October 2nd. Um, yeah, October 2nd. So uh, we'll have more information again in the upcoming weeks regarding that revival, but we, we let you know that right now so you can already begin praying for that revival. Uh, so without further delay, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. We'll jump right into our study tonight as we begin a new chapter in our study of Genesis. Our kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blood. Lord, we thank you for saving us and for keeping us. We thank you for the privilege that we have to study your word tonight for the next couple of hours. And just ask, Lord, that you'd help us to get our minds off of the world, off of ourselves even, Lord, and set our affection and our attention on you and on your word here tonight. I pray that you fill me with your spirit as we teach the word of God. I trust that, that you're going to guide, lead, and direct in every aspect of the lesson, Lord, that everything that you would want said would be said and in the manner you want it said. And we pray that it would minister to your people tonight as only you can do. May your word uh, go forth, Father, and accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you send it. And we ask, Father, that you'd meet each need that's represented out there tonight, whether it's physical, financial, or spiritual, especially for lost loved ones to get saved. And help us, Lord, to have boldness. Help us to have courage in these last days to speak up and stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that the time is shorter than it's ever been for us to be a witness and a and a light and a voice for you, Lord. So help us to have that sense of urgency and to be busy about your business till you come. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 for the first time. In our study of the book of Genesis, I can say we're starting a new chapter tonight. Not a, 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 not, a, not a chapter, but a new chapter as we spent, uh, what was it, 30 lessons on Genesis chapter 1. Tonight we begin Genesis chapter 2, and going back to our original outline, we're still talking about the creation of all things. Genesis chapter 2 is going to give us a little bit more detail in regards to the creation of man, uh, and elaborate more on the, uh, the environment and uh, the, the peripherals of that creation. And I hate to use the word peripheral. I don't know if there's a better term. But when we're talking about environment, we're talking about Eden. We're talking about the peripherals, for lack of better term. We're talking about the details of the creation of Eve for Adam, a help that is meet for him. So that's what Genesis chapter 2 is all about. So Let's just jump right into it here. Genesis 2 and verse number 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So note here that in contrast to Genesis 1-1, one, one, 
where it said, In the beginning God created the heaven, singular, and the earth. Here in Genesis 2, verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens, plural, and the earth were finished. Why the difference? Well, going back to our study of Genesis 1, 1, we indicated that the word heaven there is uh, actually indicative of a plurality in unity. And it's in reference to what we believe to be both what we know today as the second heaven and the third heaven. Some people think it's just one heaven, and, and I'll be honest, it could be. And if it is, then it's just the second heaven. But I tend to think that in Genesis 1-1, we not only have the creation of what we know today as the second heaven or outer space, but also the third heaven, okay? And that being the case, then here in chapter 2, verse 1, where there's a distinction between uh, the word heavens here and the word heaven in Genesis 1, 1, the, the difference is due to the fact that right there on the second day of creation, you have the formation of the first heaven, the earth's atmosphere. So it, it, it takes in all three heavens at this point in Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, all the host of them. So the heavens and the earth represent all of the habitations, the habitations. The host represents all the inhabitants, okay? And note there is no reference to any alien Species, and I use the word alien as it's commonly referred to today, not as it's used in the Bible, which means just a foreigner or a stranger, but as it's used in common vernacular, uh, an extraterrestrial biological being, uh, a, uh, an entity from a different galaxy or universe even, certainly another planet. Uh, there's no mention of that in Genesis 1. And they're not included in all the host of them here because all the host are what's included in Genesis 1 as well as elsewhere in the Bible where it talks about creation. So I believe it also includes the angels, but it does not include any other biological entities elsewhere in this universe. So in that regard, as we've said before, uh, man is alone. And the earth is alone. There are no other planets out there, exoplanets, that are inhabited with life. I know that from a purely logical, mathematical, scientific standpoint, when you take into consideration all of the stars, and we've given you in previous lessons an estimation of how many stars there are in the known universe. And when you start thinking about what it takes for there to be uh, biological life, okay, I, I understand that the odds are there has to be something else out there. But we have to understand that life doesn't spontaneously appear. Life is not something that is that comes about by accident. Creatures have a creator. And if the design and purpose and plan of the creator is for life to be concentrated in one place in his universe, then that's the way it's going to be. And folks, that's exactly the way it is. Okay? There is no biological life anywhere else in this universe. Okay? Now, that said, is it possible that there's microbial life somewhere in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. I will grant you that possibility. And the reason I say that is because of the, of the flood. And we'll talk more about that when we get to Genesis chapter 7, okay? And the possibility that um, microbial life uh, was taken up into the upper atmosphere of the earth because of the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep. But we'll talk about that. But as far as leaving 
the outer reaches of Earth's atmosphere and going out into what we know as outer space, the second heaven, and other planets even in our solar system like Mars or a moon uh, like um, Titan that orbits Saturn or Io or Europa um, or some of these exoplanets that we hear about now that have all the conditions to support life because they have water and they're close enough to a to a young star that that biological life as we know it can be supported well just because the conditions appear to be there doesn't mean that life is there again because conditions um, don't bring forth life a creator does and the creator determines when and if that life comes into being. And, and based on the Bible, which is the inspired word of God, there is only one place in all this vast universe that God has chosen to create biological life, physical life. And that is Earth. Period. Okay? So let's talk about all the host. Um, Psalm 33 and verse number 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So that's a cross-reference here to Genesis 2 and verse number 1. This word host is a military term. Didn't know if you knew that. But the word host is a military term. By definition, it means a company. Uh, it can also mean one who entertains another at his house. And I emphasize that phrase, at his house. For a reason, and we'll explain in just a moment. Uh, the word host can mean a landlord, an innkeeper. It can mean the exact opposite and refer to a guest. As we said, it's a military term, and host can refer to an army or a number of men that have been equipped and embodied for war. The word host can also refer to any great number or multitude, or it can just be a generic term to describe giving entertainment. It's the first part of this definition that establishes that the host of heaven, uh, the host of the heavens and the earth here in Genesis 2 verse 1 are the objects and the entities that are housed in them. So we said the heavens and the earth represent the habitations, all the host of them represent the inhabitants of them. And so you can count it down. We believe that all three heavens are included in the creation. So the third heaven, who are the host of the third heaven? The angels. Who are the host of the second heaven? The planets, the stars, and all the other celestial bodies. Remember, it's not just intelligent creatures, but entities as well. Okay, that represent the host. So it's, it, it includes for the second heaven such things as black holes and asteroids and comets, the whole shooting match. Okay, when it comes to the first heaven, what are, what's the host of the first heaven? Well, that's clouds and birds primarily. Then you get down to the earth and you've got your your uh, your fish, you 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 can also repeat here and say the fowl, your birds, uh, you've got all of your land animals, your cattle and your beasts, and of course you have man, all included as the host of the earth. Okay. Now the word host, if you take a look on the screen here, we got a couple of verses that show the word host. When you compare scripture with scripture, means all that is in them. All that that is in them. Exodus 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So instead of it saying all the host of them, as it does in Genesis 2, verse 1, Psalm 33, 6, it says all that in them is. And rested the seventh day. Acts 4.24, same thing. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. 
So that's the definition of the word host. So it can refer to living creatures. It can also refer to created objects. The underlying Hebrew word here is sabah. Uh, if you're taking notes, that's spelled S-A-B-A, -A, sabah. And it's also translated as not just as host or hosts in our King James Bible, but also as war 41 times, army 29 times, battle five times. So you see the, the military association with this term. It's also translated as warfare twice, soldiers one time, company one time. Uh, of course, the most predominant um, appearance is the word host or host, which is 393 times. Verse number two says, And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So if you notice there's an expression missing here in reference to the seventh day, that we saw for each one of the previous six days. And that expression is, and the evening and morning were the day. In Genesis 1 verse 5, we saw the evening and the morning were the first day. Genesis 1 verse 8, and the evening and the morning were the second day, and so on for all of the first six days of creation. But here in Genesis 2 verse 2 for the seventh day, Nothing like that is said. Why is it? Why doesn't it say, and the evening and the morning were the seventh day? Because the expression, the evening and the morning, denotes a beginning and an ending. Okay? And we're going to see in a moment here that the seven days of creation have a prophetic application, a very significant one. And I believe it's mapped out for us in 2 Peter chapter 3. And this prophetic application is huge in regard to God's overall plan for man. So there not being an evening and a morning where the seventh day tells us that there is no ending to the seventh day prophetically. It will be eternal. Once it starts, it never ends. Psalm 145 and Verse number 13, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. And we also see here from Genesis 2, verse 2, how the, uh, the word ended defines the word rested here in Genesis 2, verse 2. So when it says that, that the Lord rested on the seventh day from all his work. It's not that the Lord got tired, that he got uh, burnt out, that uh, he got sore and had to rest. No, he, he rested. And what that means right there at the beginning of the verse is his work ended. He was done. And when the work is done, you rest, you cease from your works. And that's how uh, it's defined. The word rest is defined in Hebrews 4, in verse number 10, where it says, For he that is entered into his rest, the Lord's rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Well, we cease from our own works spiritually when we receive Christ as our Savior. And so we enter into that spiritual rest, that rest that Jesus invited us to, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, where he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and, and I will what? Give you rest. And that is fulfilled the moment that we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. We enter into that rest. We no longer are working our way to heaven. Not that we ever could in the first place. We can't. But we were trying to. But when we receive Jesus as our Savior, all that work and labor is over. Because the work... The work is done in Christ. It is finished. Okay? Jesus' redemptive work was finished, so what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. And when we trust Christ as Savior, it's finished. 
it's done. We cease from our own works as the Lord did from his. So we mentioned this prophetic plan and that the seven days of creation are a picture of these seven uh, of this prophetic plan. The seven days of creation are a picture of God's overall um, plan for man and frankly for the entire universe. And so we have this chart up right now that you're looking at and and we apologize for those who are listening. I'll try to describe the chart for you. Um, but if you do have access to the internet, we continue to invite you to go to our website at kjbstudy.com. And in this case, you want to go to, uh, under Biblical Studies, our Genesis page. And you'll see on the right side of the page a section entitled Notes and a hyperlink for a PDF version of all the slides we present in our lessons. And you'll be able to follow along with these lessons if you're listening by way of audio only. You'll be able to see the visuals yourself and move along with us. I encourage you to do that. All right, so what we have on the screen then is we have the seven days of creation all summarized there. As you see, day one, God created uh, the light and separated it from the darkness. And on day two, the, the creation, or I should say the formation of the uh, first heaven, earth's atmosphere. Day three, you have uh, the formation of the seas and, and, and the division between the land and the sea. And of course, the, the creation of plant life. Day four, you have the formation of the sun, moon, and stars, and all the other celestial bodies of the second heaven. Day five, you've got the creation of the first animal life, the, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Day six, you've got the creation of the land animals, your cattle and your beasts and your creeping things, along with the creation of man. And day seven is the day of rest, the work's done. So in 2 Peter 3 and verse number 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So this is not just simply a statement to inform us or enlighten us that time runs differently for God who is who who dwelleth and inhabiteth eternity as Isaiah said uh, God is not subjected nor limited and confined by time he just isn't so this isn't a statement that simply reflects that truth this is I believe a prophetic statement that in context where it's referring to the heavens and the earth, and frankly, the generations of the heavens and the earth. That we'll, that we'll talk about in just a moment. But in 2 Peter 3 and uh, verse number 4 in particular, it says, where's the promise of his coming? Bible prophecy, the, the signature event of Bible prophecy from where we are right now, is the second coming of Jesus. I would say of all Bible prophecy, but I believe it shares that distinction with the birth of Jesus Christ. The first coming and the second coming of Jesus are the two mountain peaks of all of Bible prophecy. Everything else, every other biblical event, prophetic event, rotates, revolves, whatever term you want to use, around one of those two events. They are it. Okay. So here in the context, it's talking about the Lord's coming. Then you have mentioned in verse five, the heavens were of old and the earth. In verse number seven, you have mention of the heavens and the earth, which are now. In verse 13, you have the mentioning of a new heavens and a new earth. And so I believe what we have here in verse number eight, which is right there in the context of the heavens and the earth which are now, and it talks about them being reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. How long will this current heaven and earth last? How long is it going to last? And I believe that the heavens and the earth which are now are going to last 7,000 years. 
7,000 years. So for the t period of time from Genesis 1-1 until the new heavens and the new earth. Mentioned there in 2 Peter 3.13, Revelation 21.1, that the amount of time that God has appointed for this heaven and earth that he created in Genesis 1.1 and proceeded to form and fill in the rest of Genesis chapter 1 is 7,000 years. So now we go back to this formula, and a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Well, if we're talking 7,000 years, that means seven days, right? And we know that on the seventh day of creation, God rested. Interestingly enough, the final 1,000 years of the seven years that we're talking about, as far as Bible prophecy, the final 1,000 years that leads up to the new heavens and the new earth is what's known as the millennium. Latin for 1,000 years. Mill meaning 1,000, annum meaning years. It's the time of the Messianic kingdom. Isn't that interesting? It is a time of peace. It is a time of rest. It's mentioned right in there in Hebrews chapter 4, the chapter regarding rest. Spiritual rest, national rest, sabbatical rest. Four different rests are mentioned there. The Canaan rest, all of them mentioned there. The chapter on rest, the millennial rest is one of them. Amen. So what you have then is day one running from, you know, backtracking, if you're just going to put rounded dates to it. Uh, we'll put the birth of Jesus at 1 AD. And then moving forward, you got day five running from 1 AD to uh, 1000 AD. Day six running from 1000 AD to 2000 AD. Day 7, the millennium, would run from 2000 A.D. to 3000 A.D. Then you go backwards for days 1, 2, 3, and 4, which means you've got creation back, again, using round numbers, at 4000 B.C. Now, of course, those round numbers are not precise, okay? They're not exactly accurate, but they're approximately accurate. That's what you're looking at right there. Interestingly enough, the word life, the word life, as we pointed out when we studied Genesis 1, the word life first shows up in our King James Bible in Genesis 1 in verse number 21. And God created great whales. I'm sorry, verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. First appearance of the word life. And when's it occurring? On day five, which is after four days. Well, look at the chart here. After four days, what happens? The Prince of Life shows up. Not only that, He's also the water of life. Okay? So where does life first appear? In the oceans. Let the waters bring forth abundantly. Isn't that something? You can't beat that. So this day seven out here that we're talking about, the seventh day, the day that God ended his work and rested, that represents the millennium. That's amazing. So... The heavens and the earth, the current heavens and the earth, created in Genesis 1, will last 7,000 years before there's a new heaven and a new earth created. And that 7,000 years is on God's timetable, okay? Because if we were doing it based on ours, we're in overtime, because we're in 2024 AD right now. Obviously, our calendars are not aligned with God's reckoning of time right now. But we know this. Man, we got to be close. And we're closer now than we've ever been to the consummation of day six and the beginning of day seven. And yet we know that there's at least seven more years, seven more years before day seven can even begin. 
right? The seven years of Daniel's 70th week. We know that that's still left before day seven can begin. So yeah, folks, we're close. And we're closer than we've ever been. So God rested on the seventh day from all his work. So again, rested is defined in the verse as an ended work. Is also defined as ceased from works, according to Hebrews 4.10. God rested on the seventh day because his work was finished, according to verse 1, because his work had ended here in verse 2. Scripture, John 19.30, Hebrews 10.12, where we mentioned how that when Jesus' redemptive work was finished, he sat down on the right hand of the Father. So he said in John 19.30, it is finished. And Hebrews 10.12 tells us that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And by the way, we shouldn't rest either until our work is finished. I've always had a a conviction about that. And there's times where your body just won't let you and you've got to rest before the work's finished. But I've always had this compulsion within myself that um, I just can't stop until something's done. And I, it's a good quality and it's a bad quality all at the same time. But I've, I, I developed that based on this right here. Um, you know, God didn't rest until it was done. Jesus didn't rest until it was done. Now, yes and no. I mean, Jesus rested physically. He did. Uh, he went to sleep. He did do that, okay? So I, I don't mean to stretch it beyond what it, that, that it needs to be. But I've just always tried to apply that to my life, that uh, uh, only take a break when you need to, and it, you don't stop until the work's done. You keep at it. Keep at it. Keep things moving. So even if you have to rest, even if you have to, even if you have to break away um, to refresh yourself, that's all fine and good. But keep it moving. Keep it moving. Don't neglect. Okay. Verse number three. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So we see there, resting from all his work. Now, he, it says he blessed the seventh day. And although the seventh day was indeed blessed, because it says exactly that, no one at this point was commanded to observe it or even knew about it. Okay? So some people uh, say that Adam observed the Sabbath, that uh, since God rested and sanctified it and blessed it, he was expecting every human being, from starting with Adam, to observe the Sabbath day and that they were to rest as well. And you're not going to find that anywhere in your Bible. Not my Bible, not my King James Bible. You may have a Bible version that says otherwise, but, but I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware of any Bible perversion that teaches that uh, Adam and Enoch and Noah observed the Sabbath. I, I don't. I'm not aware of one, okay? Certainly not my King James, okay? Uh, what I do know from Scripture, according to Nehemiah 9.14, is that the first ones to become aware of what we just read here, that God blessed the seventh day and set it apart, sanctified it, the first ones to, to be made known of that truth were the Jews at Mount Sinai. It wasn't until the law was given, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And of course, they were introduced to a, a resting on the seventh day before the law was given earlier there in the book of Exodus. I think it was in Exodus 16. Um, but it's not until Sinai that anyone has become aware of it and it's been codified and commanded to be observed by anybody. Let's take a look at the scripture, Nehemiah 9.14. It says, And madest known unto them, Israel, thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. Then we turn to Exodus 31 and verse number 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Why? It is a sign between me 
in you. Not all of mankind. Who's he speaking to? Doesn't say, Speak thou also unto all of humanity, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. It says, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, and ye is the children of Israel. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. This is repeated in Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20, where it says, Moreover also I gave them, Israel, my Sabbaths. Why? To be a sign between me and them. Okay? It's not all of humanity to God and Israel that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Verse 20, Hallow my Sabbaths, they shall be a sign between me and you, Israel, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So again, although the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, sanctified it right here, nobody even knows about the sanctity of a seventh day Nobody is commanded to observe it and keep it and rest themselves on, a, on the seventh day until it's given to Israel at Mount Sinai. Now let's take a look at this word sanctify. That's the first appearance of any form of the word sanctify. Here it's sanctified. It's the Hebrew word kodesh. There's other forms of that word, kodesh. Uh, and so on. This particular form of the word appears 172 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. And outside of being translated various forms of the word sanctify, which it is about 108 times, it's also translated as hallow, which is a form of the word holy, 25 times. It's translated holy itself as, as seven times. It's translated dedicate, 10 times. Consecrate, five times, and so on. Those are the primary uh, ways that it's translated. The word sanctify, by dictionary definition, just simply means to set apart for the purpose and service of God. Something or someone that is set apart for the purpose and service of God. That's all it means. So God blesses the seventh day. He sanctifies it. And because that in it he rested from all his work. We commented on rested being the definite, being defined as ended his work, which God created and made. And we've mentioned before that what takes place in Genesis 1 is both a creation and a formation. You have God creating all of the matter of the known universe in Genesis 1 1. God created the heaven and the earth. So the, the earth there being literal, the earth itself, but the earth also being representative of all of the physical material, the matter of our known universe. The heaven not just being the literal second and third heaven, but being all of the space in which that matter can, be, can occupy. Okay, So there's a creation as well. In Genesis 1.21, where it talks about God creating on the fifth day the fish and the fowl. It's also mentioned in verse 27 in regard to man. So there's creative acts in Genesis 1, and then there's formative acts in Genesis 1, where God is taking the matter that was created in Genesis 1.1 and forming and fashioning it into something. And that's occurring all throughout the chapter, verse 7, verse 16, verses 25 and 26, verse 31. Creative acts, obviously, when the word created appears. Formative acts, when the word form or make or made appears, is going to signify that. Okay, But uh, God created everything, and God made everything. That's the simple truth. Uh, Colossians 1 and verse number 16. And by the way, all of this is done through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator. Okay, All of the Godhead is involved in creation. But the, the creator is the Lord Jesus. He's, he's the incarnate word. Colossians 1, 16, referring to Jesus, says, For by him were all things created. 
that are in heaven, that are in earth. And then in John 1, 3, all things were made by him. So it doesn't matter if it's a creative act, a formative act. It's all done by the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, verse number four. We're going to have to wrap it up here. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. All right, so we're not going to get through all of this. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and, and uh, wrap it up here by saying this is the first appearance of the expression, these are the generations. That entire phrase appears 11 times in our King James Bible. Okay, and uh, we're not going to show you all those because, as you can see, if you're watching this lesson, we have a different list on the screen. Because not only is this the first appearance of the longer expression, these are the generations, it's also the, obviously the first appearance of the word generation or generations, which appears a total of 225 times in the Bible, which is, uh, by the way, it's uh, three times three, which is the number of generation, times five times five. So in other words, it's nine times 25. Uh, so three being the number of generation, a generative number, and five times five, five being the number of death. Now, what is a generation? Well, the word generation can mean the act of begetting, procreation. It can mean production, formation. It can also refer to a single succession of natural descent as the children of the same parents. It can refer to people living at the same time, contemporaries, peers, okay? It can refer to a family, a race, progeny, or offspring. So there's a number of different applications and definitions to the word generations, okay? So here are the different generations that are mentioned specifically in the Bible. The first here being the generations of the heavens and of the earth in Genesis 2, verse 4. Now, uh, the bulk of these are in the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis 5, 1, we'll see the generations of Adam. Genesis 6, 9, the generations of Noah. In Genesis 10, 1, the generations of the sons of Noah. Genesis eleven ten, 10, the generations of Shem. Further in that chapter, in chapter 11, 27, you have the generations of Terah. Genesis 25, 12, the generations of Ishmael. Just a little bit further down in Genesis 25 and verse 19, you have the generations of Isaac. In Genesis 36, verses 1 through 9, you have mention of the generations of Esau. And then the last one in Genesis, in chapter 37, verse 2, is the generations of Jacob. In Numbers 3, verse 1, the generations of Aaron and Moses. In Ruth 4, 18, the generations of Perez. And then the lone mention of a, of a different generation that's mentioned in the New Testament is Matthew 1, 1, the generation of Jesus Christ. So note that all of those are in plural, generations of, except the one in Matthew, referring to Jesus Christ, where it's the generation, singular, of Jesus Christ. Very interesting. So what we have here in the first appearance of the word generation is the generations of the heavens and of the earth. And that's where we're going to pick up next time. Talking about, as I mentioned from 2 Peter 3, the generations of the heavens and of the earth. There's three generations. Three generations that consist of two entirely different heavens and earth, as we've already pretty much alluded to previously in the lesson, okay? All right, we'll take a break there. We're going to take about uh, five, ten minutes, prepare for hour number two. We hope you'll be able to come back with us to study the Gospel of Matthew. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to do that. We'll see you in just a bit, folks.